Hi, this is Dane Quinn from the University of Akron. Today I would like to discuss generalized forces as part of Lagrange's equations of motion. And this is for fundamentals of mechanical vibrations. So I'm going to start off with a slide that sort of recaps what we talked about when we did the video lecture that dealt with the development of Lagrange's equations. Right, so you know, here they are again. Uh, these are Lagrange's equations written in their general form. So we have the total derivative with respect to the time of the partial of the Lagrangian, which is the difference between kinetic and potential energies. And that partial with respect to QI dot minus then the partial of the Lagrangian with respect to QI. QI are the generalized coordinates. And that equals this capital Q, which is the generalized force associated with the ith coordinate. And again, remember, qi are a set of independent generalized coordinates, meaning they can be any coordinate that we choose, but they are independent, right? So if we have an n degree of freedom system, there are n different coordinates. And then the capital Qs are, again, known as the generalized forces. So when we develop Lagrange's equations, we kind of introduce this. And, and I want to go through that just real quickly and then get into how do we actually calculate these terms. So when we developed Lagrange's equations, we started off with momentum balance, and we just did this for a particle. But it does generalize to rigid bodies fairly easily. And, and we took a dot product with what we called a virtual displacement field, and that's this delta R term. Now, this virtual displacement field is obtained by an infinitesimal increment of the coordinates. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But essentially what we do is we take the current value of the coordinates and we just change them slightly. And by slightly, I mean an infinitesimal amount. And, and as a result, that change produces a displacement of the system. And that displacement is known as a virtual displacement field. And it's consistent with the constraints of the system. So if there are kinematic restrictions, then these virtual displacement fields respect all of those constraints. So now, if I go back and look at the equations of motion dotted with the virtual displacement field, we see this left-hand side ends up being all of the forces dotted with delta R. So these forces give rise to what's known as the virtual work. Remember, work is force dot displacement in its most simple form. And, and so again, this virtual displacement produces a virtual work. These forces we split up into three parts. One part are a set of conservative forces, so this F conserve. These are all the conservative forces. These end up going into the potential energy, and we've seen examples of that with springs and gravity. We have a set of constraint forces. And these are the forces that essentially impart the constraints of the system. And the important thing here is the constraint forces do no work because they are always perpendicular to these virtual displacement fields because we're looking at really small infinitesimal increments of the coordinates. And then finally, we have kind of everything else. Right, so this would be the kitchen sink. And these are the non-conservative forces. These are the forces that don't fit into one of these other two categories. So the conservative forces, again, are represented with the potential energy. The constraint forces do no work, so they make no contribution to the virtual work. And then we have everything else. And what we talked about, although, to be fair, we didn't really show this, um, but we kind of stated this. This can be reduced to something that looks like some quantity times the magnitude of the virtual increment of the coordinate, right? So that's this delta Q. And whatever is out front here is precisely the generalized force that goes into Lagrange's equations. So again, these generalized forces arise from the non-conservative forces acting on the system. So let's look at the virtual work done by the non-conservative forces in a little more detail. In particular, once we move to rigid objects, we ha can have non-conservative forces and non-conservative moments. So this delta R represents the, again, virtual displacement field. And we'll represent the 
any possible virtual rotations in the system with a delta theta. So for rigid objects, these are the two terms that combine to give you the generalized forces acting on Lagrange's equations. And again, once we reduce this, and we'll see examples later, then whatever sits out front of the delta Q is exactly the virtual displacement. Right, so uh, again, just to remind you, the virtual displacement, and in particular the virtual displacement fields, which are delta R and you know, delta theta, they describe the change in the configuration of the system with the virtual increment of the coordinates. So that would be either delta R or, well, actually, and or delta theta. So let's look at three examples here. The first one will take a block that is displaced. So this dashed box, this dashed line, or this dashed figure represents the initial location of the block, right? So again, these virtual increments are above and beyond kind of where the system is at. So maybe X describes the position of, of the original configuration of the system. Right, and then I will go and increment this coordinate by delta x. And so, of course, it's a we're looking at displacements. Displacements are vector quantities. So, as a result, this virtual displacement is delta r, which is delta x, in the i direction. Right, so this virtual increment produces a virtual displacement. Now let's look at another example with a bar that rotates. So again, this dashed configuration is the original position defined by an angle theta. And then we'll increment that angle by a value of delta theta. So once again, the virtual displacement field is defined by a rotation delta theta and again this displacement rotation field which is equal to delta theta in the k direction. These two examples have really just focused on a single coordinate but I could have something a little more complicated. So for example let's take a disk right and let's assume that that disk is initially located at some position x. So the center of the disk is measured by the coordinate x. And then I would like to, if this rolls without slip, I'd like to roll this disk over by an amount delta x. Right, so what happens? Well, not only does this center point move by some amount and that will be delta R of the mass center. So here G is defined as the mass center is delta X in the I direction, right? But in addition, this disk rolls, right? So if this was the initial angle theta, then we might have a rotation, again a virtual rotation, that's in the amount delta x divided by r. So as a result, the rotation field is minus delta x divided by r. So this is the angle in the k direction. So these virtual displacements right, can produce rotations here, translations, 
as in this first example, or depending on the constraints in the system, some combination of the two. So how do we actually calculate this value Q? Well, let's look at a block that has a damper. So here we will assume that the position of the damper is defined by X, or the position of the block, right, is X. And as a result, if I look at, say, a free body diagram for this system, right, you know, here's the block. And of course, we have a force that's arising from the damper. And that force has F D, which is the damping force, which is because of the constitutive law of dampers minus B X dot in the I direction. I'd like to find the corresponding virtual work under this displacement field. Right? So essentially, the idea is, is we increment the coordinates. Right? So in this case, X becomes X plus delta x and determine the displacement field. Right, so that would be essentially this delta r right, corresponding to this coordinate. So in this case delta r would simply be delta x in the i direction. So then the next step is for the forces. And this is important. These are the forces at the current state. Right? So the current position, the current time, the current position and velocity. Right? We want to calculate the virtual work. Delta WX, right? So here, the virtual work is equal to, well, F dot DR. So here, it's F of D, the non conservative force that we're interested in, dot the virtual displacement, right? So of course, substituting in, we get B times X dot in the I direction, dot delta X in the I direction. And that is equal to minus B X dot times delta X. So finally, we want to determine Q, which in this case, essentially, it's the virtual work divided by the increment in the virtual coordinate. Right? Or for this example, delta x. Right? So here, qx is equal to delta wx, the virtual work divided by the virtual displacement. Right? So we have minus b x dot times delta x divided by delta x. And of course, these cancel out. And we're left with minus b x dot. So we've basically gone through and shown in this case that the virtual work leads to a generalized force that's, in this case, exactly equal to the magnitude of the damping force in the i direction, which is not surprising. I mean, that's the force that we're, we're looking at. However, as we'll see in some other examples, we don't always simply recover the forces, right? Oftentimes, depending on the coordinates that we use, we might recover something else. We might recover something that's akin to a moment uh, or, or just really some other quantity. It's not always just the force that's the physical force that's applied is equal to the generalized force.
Okay, so now let's look at a, a, a better example. So here we have a disk, and again, this rolls without slip. That is on an inclined plane, and subject to a moment, time-dependent moment, as well as a damping and a spring force. So I'm going to go through this pretty quickly. Um, but in general, we go through and we evaluate the object. We identify the object, which is the disk here. And we identify the forces. Right? So if I look at the forces that are acting on this system, uh, there's the weight due to gravity. Uh, there's also the moment that's being applied to the system. Uh, there's a normal force. from the ground. There's a friction force which imposes the no-slip condition. And then finally, there's the spring force and the damping force. Well, let's look at these forces. In particular, the normal force and the friction force are constraint forces. So they do no work. Uh, the point of application here has zero velocity because it's rolling without slip. Right? So any force that acts at a point of zero velocity does no work. Now in addition, the weight due to gravity is conservative, as is the spring force. The only non-conservative forces that we have are the force due to damping and we'll consider the m applied moment to be a non-conservative force. So now, before we define these, let's go and look at some coordinates. Let's measure the displacement of the center of the disk. We'll call that X. We'll measure the rotation of the disk as theta. We'll assume directions I and J and then E1 and E2 which are along the plane and normal to the plane. So as a result the damping force is simply minus B times X dot in the E1 direction while the moment, the time dependent external moment is M of T in the K direction. Okay, so let's go and calculate the virtual work done by these two forces. I want to do this twice. The first time I want to do it using the coordinate x, and the second time I'd like to use theta. Remember here that x and theta are related. This is a one degree of freedom system. So x here is minus r theta. Right, so let's first consider x. and we'll consider an increment to x delta x, which means that the coordinate is incremented to x plus delta x. So here, the displacement of the center of mass of the disk, which is where the damping force is applied, is simply delta x in the i direction. While the rotation of the disk is minus delta x over r. Again, if delta x is the increment, then the change in theta is delta x divided by minus r in the k direction. So this is the displacement field. And we can now calculate the virtual work. Right? So remember the definition. Q delta x is defined as the virtual work. So we're trying to find this Q. Okay, we can calculate this, right? It's FD, it's the damping force, dot the virtual displacement of the mass center, plus the applied moment, dot the virtual rotation. So now, when I go through this, I find the following. 
fd dot delta r is this quantity dot that quantity, right? So it's minus b x dot, and I'm actually going to factor out a delta x at the end, plus now this term, which ends up being minus m of t divided by r delta x. So comparing this. And this, we see that the generalized force is minus b x dot minus m of t divided by r. So again, we calculate the virtual work, and then from that, we identify the generalized force. So now, I'd like to use theta. We wouldn't do both of these at once because with Lagrange's equations we can only use one independent coordinate. So we'd have to choose x or theta. But I want to show you what happens when we choose both of them. So now we'll consider an increment to the angle. Right? So as a result, theta becomes theta plus delta theta. Right, so I'm going to increment this angle by an infinitesimal amount. And of course we again have to calculate the displacement field. So now the center of the disk is incremented minus r delta theta because of the constraint relationship in the i direction. And the virtual rotation field is just delta theta in the k direction. And once again we calculate the virtual work. Except now we'll be calculating Q theta, the generalized force associated with the angle theta. Again, that's going to be the virtual work, which is just like before, FD dot delta R plus M dot the rotation field. But now these two quantities are different because we're incrementing a different coordinate. And we find now that this becomes b x dot times minus minus, so that's a positive r. So we end up with b x dot times r plus dotting these two together we just get m of t and we factored out a delta theta. So we find that Q theta is B x dot times R plus M of T. However, we're using the angle theta. So I want to write x in terms of theta, which I can do using my constraint relationship. And we end up with minus B r squared theta dot plus m of t. So here are my generalized forces. This is the generalized force that corresponds to x and this is the generalized force that corresponds to theta. Notice it's the same problem and clearly these two are related to one another. but they are different things. Depending on the coordinate that we choose, we may end up with a different generalized force. Okay, so now let's look at an actual multi-degree of freedom example. Here we have two blocks connected by springs with a damper between block one and block two. Using Lagrange's equations, I'd like to find the equations of motion for this system. Okay, so as always, we start and we kind of think about the problem. I am going to go through this pretty quickly because this problem is relatively straightforward. And actually, without the damper, I did this problem when I considered momentum balance. This is one of the examples that we looked at. So here, it's a two degree of freedom system. The spring forces are conservative. And the only non-conservative force we have 
is due to the damper. Right, so the damping force of the damper is non-conservative and therefore will have to be included in the generalized force. So the first thing we do obviously is um, look at coordinates. So here I'm going to use x as the displacement of the first mass. I'll use y as the displacement of the second mass. And then because we'll also be interested in the spring between and the damping between, right? we need a coordinate that describes the relative motion. Right, so that we'll call z. And of course here we have a constraint equation because we have three coordinates and a two degree of freedom system. Right, so we can show that y is equal to x plus z. Again, I'm going to go through this pretty quickly and really focus on the, ge the generalized forces. So the kinetic energy is due to the two masses. And the total energy is the kinetic energy in mass 1 plus the kinetic energy in mass 2. Right, so for mass 1, it's just m1 over 2 x dot squared. x is the displacement, absolute displacement of this block. For mass 2, m2 over 2 y dot squared because y is the absolute displacement with respect to the ground. And then the potential energy is due to the two springs. And we have the potential energy in spring 1 plus the potential energy in spring 2. Spring 1 is K1 divided by 2 times the stretch, which we assumed was X. And then for spring 2, we have K2. And then the stretch here now is Z. So we can write the Lagrangian as the difference between the kinetic and potential energies. So it's m1 x dot squared plus m2 over 2 y dot squared. So this is the kinetic energy now minus the potential energy. K1 over 2 x squared plus K2 over 2 z squared. Now that we have the Lagrangian based on the kinetic and potential energies, let's go and calculate the generalized forces. Here I've reproduced the system with the coordinates just for reference. But now remember that the Lagrangian is written in terms of independent coordinates. So here we have a two degree of freedom system. So we can only have two coordinates in Lagrange's equations. However, we have three that we've used, so we have to make some choices. Ultimately, we'll find that the generalized forces depend on the set of coordinates. We saw that before, but we'll see another example of that here. So, let's go ahead and start this process. We need to find the well, we need to find the, the forces themselves. I will construct the free body diagram, but with only the non-conservative forces present. Right, so there's one block. We'll put our second block up here. And then these forces are of equal magnitude, opposite direction. So here, 
we find that the force acting on block 1 is B times Z dot in the I direction. So if Z is positive, that means that the distance between these two is increasing. If Z dot is positive, then this force tends to pull this block along. And then this force is impeded, right? Or this force impedes the motion. So it's minus B Z dot in the I direction. So the Lagrangian must be written in terms of independent coordinates. So we have to choose two of these. So let's choose x and y. Right? Those will be the two coordinates that I write the equations of motion in. In terms of, so let's calculate qx, the generalized force associated with x. Right? So that means x is incremented while y stays the same. So what's the virtual displacement of the first block? Well, x is incremented, so this block moves. And it moves by an amount delta x in the i direction. The second block, on the other hand, doesn't move at all, right? So it just stays where it is because y doesn't change. So now the virtual work done is force dot displacement. Right, so I have BZ dot in the I direction, dot delta X in the I direction, plus force minus BZ dot in the I direction, dot displacement. Right, but that's zero. So this becomes B times Z dot delta X. So examining this, we find that QX is B Z dot. Or back in terms of X and Y, and remember that Y here is X plus Z, then Z is equal to Y dot minus X dot. So that's the generalized force associated with X. So now let's look at the generalized force associated with y. x stays the same. y is incremented. So once again, we calculate the virtual displacement of block 1, which ends up being 0 because x doesn't change. And the virtual displacement of block 2 is delta y in the i direction. Okay, so now, the virtual dis work done is force BZ dot in the I direction dot virtual displacement, zero. Because that's for block one. And then for block two, we have minus BZ dot in the I direction. But now the virtual displacement is delta Y in the I direction. So this becomes minus b z dot delta y and as a result picking off the e factor that multiplies delta y we find that qy is minus b z dot or again using my constraint relation b x dot minus b y dot so kind of to summarize, we have these generalized forces. We know that z is equal to y minus x, and the Lagrangian is m over 2 x dot squared plus m2 over 2 y dot squared, so that's the kinetic energy, minus the potential energy, which is k1 over 2 x squared and then k2 over 2 z but z was y minus x okay so here I've rewritten all that there's the Lagrangian there is the there are the generalized forces so now we just have to go and calculate Lagrange's equations let's do these partial derivatives partial of L with respect to x dot is equal to 
m1 x dot partial of L with respect to y dot is m2 y dot minus the partial of L with respect to x is equal to k1x plus k2 times y minus x but then we have to take a derivative of what's inside so we pick up another factor of minus 1 partial of L with respect to y the negative of that and again this negative sign in the definition of the Lagrangian kinda just bring over to the left hand side we end up with k2 y minus x so Lagrange's equations for x we end up with well the total derivative of this with respect to time so that's m1 x double dot minus this so that's plus k1 x plus k2 I'll flip I'll bring that minus 1 in here x minus y equals qx so actually I'll write that as minus b x dot minus y dot and for the second equation we have the same form for Lagrange's equations and this leads to m2 y double dot plus well actually let's write this put the x term first minus k2 x plus k2 y equals minus b y dot minus x dot now I'll write these in matrix form so the mass matrix here ends up being diagonal so the system is actually dynamically uncoupled x double dot y double dot now we have a damping matrix and so when we bring this to the other side the damping matrix looks like b minus b minus b and minus b or plus b there x dot y dot right so again I brought this to the other side and I'm just writing it in matrix form and then finally the stiffness matrix k1 plus k2 notice that both of these are x terms and then minus k2 minus k2 and then plus k2 x and y equals zero so once again this is the mass matrix this is the damping matrix and this is the stiffness matrix here all three of these are symmetric the mass matrix and the stiffness matrix are always guaranteed to be symmetric when we derive the equations usually using Lagrange's equations okay so we did this example we chose X and Y I'd actually like to do it one more time but now I'd like to choose a different set of coordinates so different coordinates lead to different generalized forces and not only are we looking at say QY now instead of Q or sorry not only will be will, will we will we be looking at QZ we'll choose X and Z here instead of QY right but even the QX term will change so the generalized force that we obtain doesn't just depend on the coordinate that we're looking at it actually depends on the whole set of coordinates right so here I've reproduced the coordinates and the free body diagram so 
as we said, we'll choose X and Z. So now, QX, well, X becomes X plus delta X, and Z stays the same. So if I look at this, clearly the block one is incremented by a value delta x. But what about block 2? Because we have to look at the displacement of where these forces are applied. This force is applied to block 1. This force is applied to block 2. Right? So under this displacement field, block 2 actually moves. right? Because block 1 moves, but then z has to stay the same. Right? So in order for z to m stay the same, the relative displacement must stay the same, right? So block two gets bumped over as well, right? So the displacement of block two actually in this case is now delta x. So when we calculate the virtual work, well, same thing, right? B, Z dot in the I direction, dot the displacement plus the other force from the other side of the damper minus bz dot in the i direction dot the displacement delta x in the i direction right but look what happens this becomes zero because this first term is bz dot delta x and then the second term is the negative of that so those two cancel each other out so as a result we find that for this set of coordinates qx is actually equal to zero there's no generalized force applied to Lagrange's equations. While in the previous example, when we had x and y, we did have a qx. So once again, the generalized force depends on the whole set of coordinates that we choose. But now let's go and calculate qz. So here x stays the same, and z is incremented. So block 1 doesn't move. But block 2 does get incremented by a value of delta z. Right, so here, the virtual work is, well, this force, but now dotted with 0, plus the second force, bz, negative bz dot in the i direction, dotted with delta z in the i direction. So we end up with minus bz dot delta z. So here qz is minus b z dot. So once again we have our constraint equation x y is equal to x plus z and now the Lagrangian written in terms of x and z becomes m1 over 2 x dot squared now this next term was m2 over 2 y dot squared, but of course y is x plus z, so y dot becomes x dot plus z dot. And then the kinetic energy, or sorry, the potential energy, actually remains relatively straightforward. k1 over 2 x squared, because x measures the stretch in this first spring k2 over 2 z squared because now z directly measures the stretch in the second spring. So here again I've rewritten everything. There's the Lagrangian again. Um, there are the generalized forces, Lagrange's equations. So let's take these partials just like we did before. Partial of L with respect to x dot. So now that becomes m1 x dot from this term plus m2 x dot plus z dot. When I take the partial with respect to z dot, we get m2, and again x dot plus z dot. When we take the partial with respect to x, it's just k1x, and then the partial of minus l with respect to z, k2 times z. So, let's calculate Lagrange's equations. d dt 
partial of L with respect to X dot minus the partial of L with respect to X equals QX. So here we need to take a total derivative with respect to time. So that's M1 X double dot plus M2 X double dot plus Z double dot and then minus the partial with respect to L so that's just K1X equals zero. So there's actually no effective damping in this first equation. But the first equation is coupled to the second equation right through the value of Z. Right, so the second equation is the partial of L with respect to Z dot. Partial of L with respect to Z <laughs> equals QZ. Right, so now M2 x double dot plus z double dot when we take the total derivative k2z equals minus bz dot and I just realized there's a typo here right, so I'll just add a little negative there So, these are the equations of motion. Once again, I can write these in matrix form. Now the mass matrix, which was uncoupled, now becomes dynamically coupled. Right, so x double dot is m1 plus m2. We have an m2 there. m2, m2. Right, so in these coordinates, the system is dynamically coupled. the damping matrix is 0, 0 because there's no x dot or z dot in, in the first equation. In the second equation we get simply a b times z dot term. Once again though this is symmetric. And then finally we have a diagonal stiffness matrix. So the system is statically uncoupled. So here in these coordinates, mass, damping, and stiffness matrices are as shown. So here this is a this is a nice example, right? We've done it two different ways with two different sets of coordinates. And, and what we see is you get different equations of motion depending on the coordinates that you use. And in particular, I had an x coordinate in both formulations, but the equation of motion in terms of x, the Lagrange's equations with, with q equals x, they, they, they look completely different, right? Because everything depends on the whole set of coordinates, not just on the one coordinate that you're choosing. Right, so here we've given a, a pretty good introduction, I think, to, to generalized forces, and in particular, non-conservative effects. And ultimately, it relies on this idea of, of virtual displacements, increments in the coordinates, and then determining how much virtual work is done by that displacement field. So I'll do some examples later, uh, but for now, I think that's it. Thanks a lot, and have a great day. Bye.